and look at this shit. Look at the size of this mound. I mean, these bastards would skeletonize a cow. Not that I have a problem with that, but um, that just, you know, tells you how quickly they'd skeletonize me uh, in just seconds. Look at this. Look what lurks beneath. Yeah. That is the scourge of South Florida right there. If those goats were still around, probably not have as much of a problem with them. Anyway, there it is. Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on, you know, it's a fair enough. It's a fair enough Naples morning. The temperature's probably around 70. It's about 20 degrees warmer than it should be right now. I've, you know, I've been getting a little bit spoiled this winter uh, with the uh, cooler temperatures, but we're in a little bit of a string right now of, I won't call them much warmer than usual temperatures for the area. It's probably just usual with, you know, lows in the high 60s and highs up in the low 80s, but um, yeah, you know, it sucks. I mean, I really was enjoying having highs in the low 70s and a, a bit of cooler weather, but yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, you got to just plug along and, you know, keep a positive attitude, which frankly is something that I swear by is, you know, being as positive as possible at all times. But uh, anyway, what I have today is a 1986 Porsche 944. And this is going to be a quick take on this. I have done a 944 before, uh, a while back. I did a, it might have even been a 96. No, it was a 44, a Cabrio. Um, not terribly long ago. And then before that, I had a 944S in 87. They're a little bit rare. Uh, but I couldn't track that down, or at least I couldn't track down my notes on it. So anyway, long story short, Peter called me and said, hey, I have a 944 here. I think it's from his proctologist. I don't know what he's doing to it. And um, do you want to do a video on it? So yeah, well, sure, what the hell? You know, I'm never going to turn down a 944. Uh, they're just fun cars to... Uh, to uh, talk about. So we're going to get right into it and do a quick take. And it all began back in the 70s uh, with the VW Porsche Group. And that is not Porsche per se. It was a different company. Uh, they were responsible for the 914, this uh, VW Porsche Group, which was sold in Europe under both badges, both Porsche and Volkswagen. And they wanted to come up with something to replace it because, of course, it was getting a little bit long in the tooth at that point. Uh, so they created the EX425 program uh, to develop a replacement for that car. And, you know, again, if it had come to fruition, it would have been sold. Um, well, actually, it would have been sold as an Audi. Uh, with Porsche having a slightly different version. But the whole thing was scrapped when VW hit financial difficulties, and uh, they decided to go instead with the Scirocco, which was already underway. Uh, that would be its sports car, and Audi would take, you know, whatever remnants of that EX425 architecture were hanging around, and they'd uh, put it towards the Audi 100. But... That still left Porsche needing a replacement for the 914, which, you know, did fairly well for them. Uh, you know, they need a entry-level car as well as their 911. And uh, the, the, so they did, started developing it. They started putting it together. If you remember in the 70s, Porsche knew, or at least thought, that the 911 was doomed, living past its prime, and they were going to have to replace it. So they came up with the 928, uh, which was a front-engined, front-engined, water-cooled, uh, V8-powered Grand Tour that was destined to replace the 911, at least in the minds of Porsche. Uh, and uh, this car, what, yeah, what would ultimately became this car, uh, would be its lesser stablemate. And they ended up making it, and they called it the 924. And the 924, which, by the way, I kind of like. I mean, <laughs> the only one. It seems to be like the most hated, popular car ever. I mean, it sold very well. People seem to, you know, like the looks of it and the idea of it, but many purists considered 
the premise of a water-cooled front-engine Porsche to be an absolute disgrace, and pretty much everyone universally agreed that its two-liter five-cylinder engine was awful. Uh, it was basically a VW Audi engine. Uh, it just was buzzy and vibrating, and, uh, and on top of that, you could find it under the hood of a Volkswagen van, uh, an Audi 100, and there was even a variation under the hood of a Gremlin. I swear to God, an AMC Gremlin had a version of that 924 engine. And this is not exactly uh, what we would call Porsche exclusivity. Um, and, you know, it would have been very easy to give up on the whole thing, quietly tuck it away and, you know, move on with something else. But the Germans are stubborn, you know, to say the least. And Porsche believed, again, that the 911 was on the way out and uh, the 928 was going to be the future, which of course it wasn't. So they kept developing the 924 to be the lower price stable mate, but then they, they built a turbo version of it, uh, which, uh, you know, was pretty neat and it had kind of flared fenders and, uh, you know, well, if the first one didn't, but then a different Carrera GT version did, but it looked cool. And then they decided to build a race car. Um, they wanted to make something for Le Mans. They took that 924 platform, but they needed an engine. So what they did was they took the 928 engine, which was, you know, they looked around at other stuff. There was a Volvo Peugeot Renault engine, but it wasn't very promising. That's the one that went in the DeLorean and some other stuff. And they just couldn't find anything they liked. So they said, eh, hell with it. We're going to build our own. And uh, the way that the assembly line was set up, the engine had to be installed from underneath. So a V wouldn't work or... Uh, an inline six was too long, so it still had to be a four cylinder. Uh, what they did was basically, and it's not quite this simple, but basically they cut the 928 engine in half, uh, which was a five liter V8, and they came up with a 2.5 liter four cylinder. Uh, they wanted it to be smoother because, of course, that was the number one complaint about the four cylinder in the 24. So they decided to use balance shafts. Well, it turned out balance shafts were actually invented uh, by Mitsubishi, who held the patent on them, and they were a reverse spinning shaft. It turned at twice the speed of the engine, and uh, it, it smoothed the whole thing out. So a four-cylinder felt a lot more like an inline six than a buzzy little four. Uh, Porsche tried to improve on the design. They couldn't. Then they tried to make a variation of it, which they really couldn't you know, they couldn't do in any way that made sense. So they decided the hell with it. We're going to use the Mitsubishi system and we'll just pay them a, you know, patent fee on every car we build, which is what they ended up doing. Uh, but that engine ended up being pretty great. They put it in that... Um, in that race car, which was called the 924 GTP Le Mans, uh, it performed exceptionally well. Uh, it won its class in the race quite handily and actually finished seventh overall, uh, which was a tremendous showing for a car in the class it was in. And, you know, the big hot rod Ferraris and GT4, I mean, to come in seventh was quite a feat. And uh, doing that, it proved fuel efficient, it proved reliable. They, you know, in a 24 hour race, they stopped 21 times for gas, which was apparently quite good. And uh, it turned out to be very well. So they decided the hell with it. That engine is gonna be the basis for the next evolution of the 924 platform. And that would be the 83 944, which is essentially this car a couple years later, but that was it. Uh, and with the 44, Porsche basically addressed every issue, uh, well, except it being air-cooled and ass-engined, you know. They were never going to make those guys happy. Uh, but otherwise, they addressed all the issues with the car. Uh, it now had a true Porsche engine that people could be proud of, and the cuteness of the 924 became much more macho and aggressive with these sort of large flared steel fenders. Very, very iconic to me, uh, which were aggressive. They looked great. Uh, it was a look borrowed from that Le Mans car and a uh, production turbo version earlier. Uh, and some hot rod guys, you know, made cafe racers out of 24 with the flared fenders. Porsche must have looked at those and all that. And man, that thing looks great with it. So they did it and they produced it. And here it is. Uh, and it worked extremely well. It, it, 
you know, here's the thing. I mean, it wasn't just that the car looked good, which it did. It came out at the absolute perfect time. Uh, it came out sort of with the big uh, yuppie uprising of the early 1980s, and it became an aspirational car that was relatively attainable. Uh, you know, when they had the 924, it worked for a little while, but the badness of that platform, the you know, the engine that people hated, drove people towards the Datsun Z car and the Mazda RX, which were quicker and frankly, more fun to drive with more pep. Well, now they came back with the 44 with the better engine, and it kind of dragged those guys back to uh, Porsche. Even if the car cost a little more, it was still attainable. It was still Porsche's entry-level car. Uh, and, you know, it had everything to boot. I mean, it had uh, four-wheel independent suspension. It had a near-perfect 50-50 weight distribution because they used a transaxle in the back like a more modern Corvette. Uh, it drove like a sports car without all the buzzy and anemic feel of the early 924s and just became an absolute hit. Uh, it showed up in TV and the movies. Uh, Miami Vice, you'd see it, you know, cameoing on that all the time. Sixteen Candles, probably one of the more famous showings of the car. Uh, what's his face? That Jake guy, you know, driving the red one around, which, um, you know, again, was a pretty big movie at the time and helped to cement the 944 in pop culture history. Um, it, there was even a song in popular rock and roll, a, a, kind of a one hit. I think there were a couple of producers who had other stuff going, but they had one song that was a hit, David and David, uh, Welcome to the Boomtown. And the opening lyrics of that song are, Miss Christina drives a 944, satisfaction oozes from her pores. I'm not gonna do the or, <laughs> I can't say it the way they do. Uh, there's cocaine on the dresser and bars on the door. Uh, very, very 1980s and, uh, you know, a flash of a 944 driving through the music video. So uh, it just became sort of an iconic 80s thing. On a side note, my friend Robert the Pollock, and friend is just a descriptive term. He's one of the most brutal, horrible people on earth in an eternal struggle with Chris to become the worst human being on earth and does a very good job of it sometime. I could sit down in front of a camera, which I wouldn't do because nobody wants to see that, but I could, and I could spend, you know, a good 90 minutes talking about all the crap that makes Robert so awful. Uh, you know, I remember once I mentioned in view of his wife that talking to him was like shoving a pine cone up your rear end and my god did she enthusiastically agree she absolutely believed that was true but anyway he has this mothballed 944 sitting in his garage uh, we found it in a barn a few years ago he never did anything with it he just brought it home it still got all the dust over it and uh, he said he just likes looking at it it's just when he opens up the garage door it's sitting there and it makes him feel nice so Anyway, it's just one of those things. But development continued. In 86, there was a turbo version of this car that came out uh, to great acclaim. Um, it had a lot more horsepower. It was a true Corvette competitor at that point, even if it was pretty expensive and, um, and worked very, very well. Uh, it, it, they came out, then the 944, the base developed. You know, in 87, there was an S version with 16 valves and uh, bumped up the horsepower another 30 or 40. Then there was a three liter version that came out called the S2 a few years after that. Uh, and then the car had finally evolved enough after to get a different nomenclature and became the 968. Uh, but in the end, a total of 163,192 two uh, cars in the 944 family were produced between, you know, the 82 for the 83 model year in 1991. And it made it the most successful sports car in Porsche history until the introduction of the Boxster Cayman and uh, then the 997 Carrera. And, you know, the Boxster Cayman only came about because the purists demanded what they demanded. Had it been left up to Porsche, the 944 would have continued development as a front-engined uh, car, you know, not mid or back-engined, uh, as would the 928. And, you know, the 911s would be a thing of the past, you know, beloved by some old retired architects and cardiovascular surgeons who say they were the greatest thing that ever was made and that's where we'd be today but uh, anyway i just love the 44 i think it's kind of a neat piece 
I'll sum it up a little bit later on, but um, I'm going to take a little break now and get my crap together. We'll have a look around the styling of this thing, then we'll take it for a drive. So bear with me one moment. All right, so let's get back into this thing. And I'll tell you something, an in internet search about 944s is kind of funny. Um, you know, funny, peculiar, more than ha-ha. You know, everyone who chimes in, and God knows there's an endless parade of people who do, including myself, uh, they say you should buy one. You, they're, they're bargain, they're good deals. You should go out and get, go rush out and get a 944. But they also say you'll get hosed on repairs and that the bulk of them are much more troublesome than you might think, even more so than their reputation. But if you buy a great one with a strong service history, uh, then, well, you're gonna be a little bit safer. Well, you know, no shit. I mean, in other news, try not to piss on the toilet seat. You know, any car that has very enthusiastic maintenance is going to be better, but of course it's going to cost a lot more. And part of the joy of some of these 944s is that they can be bought for peanuts. So, you know, if you're one of the guys who can't afford the service history, you know, high-end bring a trailer piece, but you can get into the tired, you know, somewhat neglected unit, well, yeah, you're going to have to turn a few more wrenches. You might have to learn a few things. You might have to, you know, do what you can do to keep things going, but at least you can buy the thing and get into it and make it happen. I mean, you know, it's easy to go out and buy one with the, the best records, but yeah, who always has that kind of dough? Uh, personally, I think the 944 is a good car, but not a great one. And, you know, that's more of a general impression from sort of taking in the whole discussion about them. I think if it was a great car, it would be more valued today than it is, uh, you know, because, it, you know, the Corvette C4 in its own way, I think, is a great car, but it's still undervalued. But I think that's artificial because they made so many of them. There's so many turds that are out there. Um, you know, the quality control wasn't what it was at Porsche at the time. Uh, but the 944 has every opportunity to be more collectible than it is. It's from Porsche, which, you know, of course, has the storied and glorious name. Uh, it's a good looking car and um, you know and there's a few out there so I think if the car was great it would be recognized as such but what it is is it's good and it's fun. Uh, you know I see it as sort of an iconic 80s car right up there with like the IROC Z and the E30 BMW you know the M3 and the C4 Corvette and the 280Z, you know, that sort of thing. It just is part of that 80s shtick that I absolutely love and that was, of course, a big part of my youth. It's really hard for a Gen Xer not to look at a 944 and remember, you know, remember it with some kind of fondness. So, you know, again, even if it's not a great car, it's a fun one. It's rewarding to own. And because of Porsche's incredible efforts on it, uh, it is a real Porsche. I mean, with an air-cooled be damned, uh, ass engine be damned. I mean, Porsche did what it took to make the car worthy of their name plate if you're one of those people that you know thinks that means something and to some extent that I am uh, the 924 yeah not so much but it was a pretty good basis for it so anyway look let's have a look around this thing uh, the stylate I think is quite lovely I love the pop-up headlights I love the integrated bumper uh, the low front air dam with the fog lights the euro cars would have had lights were those uh, protruding bumper strips are on the uh, US models, but of course that's what we had to have at the time. The lights do look a little bit better. Uh, you see the Porsche badge there with the uh, prancing horse and you know, whatever else it's got. Um, side marker lights, phone dial wheels, which obviously are going to be a mystery why they're called that to anyone under the age of 30. <laughs> my nephew, at Christmas we made my nephew dial an old telephone. It was absolutely hilarious, but um, uh, you could also get Fuchs wheels uh, earlier when the ABS came out that, you know, that came to an end. Um, nice little impact strip on the door. You got a Hoffmeister kink on the rear quarter window there. Uh, kind of a lovely rounded greenhouse. The thing had like a 0.35 drag coefficient, so it was pretty slippery. Um, you know, those flared fenders are absolutely signature and look terrific. Going into sort of wraparound taillights, I don't believe that 944 uh, thing in the middle is standard. I think that's one of those kits people put in to sort of 
I'm not a fan, but you know, other people like it, and it doesn't light up, but it moves the license plate down, and yeah, I don't know, I think it looks a little weird. Uh, I like the uh, wraparound spoiler around the hatchback, I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, strange, um, actually it's not, that's the location of the factory alarm. I, I, I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's factory, which gives you two keys, which I think is kind of strange and weird, and definitely not something anyone would do today. But let's have a look inside the hatch. And of course the hatchback did make it fairly useful in terms of storage, certainly much more so than a 911, which had absolutely crappy storage. All right, there we go. And there you see it. So it's got a pretty good hatch area. You'll be able to fit your little German toddlers in there with no problem. It's got a uh, roll back cover for them if you know they start getting annoying. Uh, this leather vinyl thing will actually accommodate the uh, sunroof that can be removed altogether. It powers to tilt up in the back, but you can also take it out, put it in that bag, and put it in the back. Although I think the car probably looks a little bit weird with just a big hole in the roof, uh, you know, while still having framed glass on the side, but um, I rarely see anyone driving the cars that way. But if you want to, you can do it. Uh, you can see from the hump here, there's a little spare tire underneath and, you know, more than enough cargo room to take a nice weekend trip somewhere. Uh, you also get rear seats, which now well, I'll open the door, we'll have a look at them, but they're pretty small and uh, they do fold down for a little extra room. Let's have a look under the hood. Oh, they're closed, Porsche quality. You can actually feel a pretty good build quality in this car. Uh, and that uh, is, of course, what... Oh, God. Oh, everything's hard. That is, of course, what Porsche did at the time. They, um, you know, they were, they were pretty good at putting cars together. All right, so under here, this is the engine that made the 924 for real. Uh, this is 2.5 liters, about 150 horsepower. Uh, it's got the two balance shafts from Mitsubishi. Um, it is, it's just a good solid motor without any question. Supposedly half the, 928 motor, although there aren't really any interchangeable parts. Uh, it uses a pretty traditional German suspension. You got McPherson struts up front with coil springs. You got semi trailing arms in the back with torsion bars. And uh, it handles, you know, pretty damn well. Uh, they also went to great lengths to isolate noise and vibration, which of course was the number one problem with the 24. So it has this convoluted aluminum engine mount with two hydraulic um, engine mounts that, I mean, very, very complex for a set of engine mounts, but they do isolate it well. The transaxle has more traditional rubber isolators, and even the steering rack has rubber isolators. So uh, they went to great lengths to make sure that the four-cylinder didn't belie the fact that this was a well-made German Porsche, and they pulled it off. Uh, it continued to evolve. Again, in 86, the 44 Turbo came out. Supposedly, they were a bit problematic, but uh, they were pretty important cars at the time. It actually had two airbags in it, Standard, which was the first car to have that. Uh, it also had um, standard ABS brakes, but I think the Corvette did at the same time. Somebody will probably correct me on that. Uh, but um, that, that was a leap forward. Uh, then in 87, there was a 16-valve uh, S version, 944S, put out 187 horsepower, much more peppy. Uh, a couple years after that, they um, uh, that was a 2.7, by the way, and then they bumped it up to 3 liters a couple of years after that in the S2 version, uh, and that put out 211 horse, which was almost as much as the 86 turbo. It performed just about as well as that and uh, did so more reliably, but of course the turbo at that time had moved up to like 240 horsepower, so after that it became um, the 968 and basically a different car altogether, even if I'm pretty much the same architecture. So uh, a well-developed car by Porsche, you know, against the odds, against the grain, against customer demands. And, um, you know, they've left us with kind of a fun little toy uh, that people can buy today when other vintage Porsches are just too expensive. And yeah, I mean, you got zero to 60 in eight seconds. You got a quarter mile in 16. 
any family crossover today or run circles around it. But at the time, that was quick and peppy and uh, and fun to drive. And those qualities do still remain with the car today. So, uh, all right, there it is under the hood. I'm going to get my crap uh, uh, back. Actually, you know what? I've got a long story, but I came here in my truck to do this car. So I'm just going to take a break for a minute. Then we're going to go for a spin, have a look inside and see what we got. Uh, before I do that, let me run these headlights one more time. Probably my favorite thing in the entire world, lower the hood to do it, are pop-up headlights. Like the station wagon, it's one of the great losses of Western civilization. Look at this. Look at that, nothing. <laughs> nothing because you have to have the key on. Oh God, why am I always thwarted? Always. Okay, key in the ignition, let's try that again. There they are, love it. Nothing in the world that I enjoy more than pop-up headlights, but yeah, we all have our thing, so. There it is, take a break, back in a minute. All right, let's have a look inside this thing. I like the little Porsche script on the back of the spoiler. I think that looks kind of cool. Uh, this one doesn't have the rear wiper option. This is so 80s to me. So it doesn't have the option, so they just put a plug in the hole in the window. All the, all the windows are the same, whether you got a wiper or not. It's just more bespoke. You know, the again, the phone dial wheels, I think, look pretty cool. You got little Porsche scripts. Uh, inside the door handles with a little pinch there. Uh, you get good quality, you know, the way this thing closes. Nice solid thud. Uh, big stocky rear view mirrors, by the way, on the side. A uh, couple of very nice bucket seats. Obviously, that's what it would have. So they, they did have a sport seat option. Uh, there you can hear the alarm going off in there. The U-boat is sinking. <sighs> Let's get in. <clears throat> Let's see what we got. So in mid-85, they upgraded the dashboard and ergonomics of the car and made it actually quite nice. Uh, it now has sort of a 911-esque oval shape to it, which is more in tune with the company's, you know, styling theme, which looks great. You got orange needled gauges replacing the weird sort of yellow ones from the 924 and uh, earlier uh, 944s. And, uh, you know, again, in the, this harkens to a time when every car company sort of had its own individual look and feel. Uh, you know, these switches were only found in Porsches and the switch gear and the steering wheels and the climate control and the clock and that sort of thing. You know, you look today and it's really hard to tell a Kia from a Mercedes from the dashboard. They they all just have the same switch gear and look and feel and infotainment and whatnot. These cars are just to me a lot more a lot more individual and that's one of the reasons I just like older cars. Alright, there's that four fire into life. Obviously, this is a pretty well-maintained unit because it's not vibrating. There's no vibration at all in the steering wheel or the pedals. Uh, the uh, gear shift isn't jumping around. Just, you know, again, big part of what made the 944 better. Uh, you can see the gauges. We've got a temp gauge, a fuel gauge, a 160 mile an hour speedo, which I don't think this thing would have pulled off, but probably somewhere in the 130, 140 range. Uh, you got a mile per gallon vacuum chart to let you know if you're doing all right there. Useless, basically. Uh, a 6,500 you know, close to it, RPM red line on the uh, tack. You got your oil pressure and your voltmeter. Nice big vents, easy to steer and control. Uh, you got your uh, defrost here, you got your climate control, which is always indecipherable in German cars, but that was part of the charm of the 80s. Uh, you got a little clock, your hazard switch, you got a glove box down there with a manual, a place to put some cans of beer when you're just hanging out. Over there, your fog light switch, your uh, blinkers, that sort of thing. This one does have cruise control. Uh, you got a little ashtray, because of course people smoke then um, this is looks well used that switch I believe that's the uh, sunroof yeah you see if I click that it'll tilt it up at the back uh, sort of vent out the cabin if you got a smelly girl with you and um, you see the gears there those things are kind of famous for stripping out but they're easy to fix and of course then this whole thing can be removed if you want to put it back inside the uh, the hatch area uh, here that changes the um, 
What the hell does that do? These are, you know, it changes which um, uh, mirror is being adjusted. But where the hell is this? Over here. So you've got your switch to actually adjust the mirrors here on the driver's door. And then you have to select which one there. You also have the fader for the stereo. Uh, obviously not this updated Pioneer, but the factory stereo off the stereo itself and down there. You know, why? <laughs> <laughs> sure someone can tell you, but I can't. Ask a German. Oh God, I'm tempted to run with the headlights up. In fact, I think I will, even though it's light out, because what the hell? I'm not always in cars that have pop-up headlights, so I'm going to enjoy it while I can. But again, very limited vibration, even on this, you know, 100,000 mile example, I'm sure has been well maintained, but still. And away we go. Uh, sort of a weird power band in this car. Virtually nothing underneath 3,500 and very little over 5,500. So it's, and you see our little upshift arrow there. That was kind of a famous 80s German. Then it comes on, and I got a one upshift now. Anyway. Um, so a weird sort of narrow middle rev band, but it does suit the car, and it's fun to track with if you know, you know, which gear to be in to hit the sweet spot. And that's why some people do, you know, look, a Miata's easy to take to the racetrack. It's going to be the same experience every time, i.e. it means it's not going to break. Uh, and um, it's very easy to manage and control. Uh, some guys, you know, it's just too perfect for them and they might gear towards a 944 for a more interesting track day. By interesting, it means it's probably going to break down. Uh, they, they, they actually handle it pretty well, uh, certainly if they're, you know, well prepped for it. But um, they're very, very fun, again, because you've got that transaxle in the back, which gives you great weight distribution. Uh, the suspension is set up for nice turn-ins. It does, you know, give you a little bit of oversteer around a corner, very easy to control, very nice feel from the steering. It just is a driver's car. And frankly, because it's not, you know, ass-engined, it's much, much better balanced. It's, you know, the 9 44 turbo would basically oh geez a little more clutch bill uh, the 944 turbo would basically turn in the same times as the 911 turbo of its day you know the two of the contemporary cars uh, frankly because the 911 turbo was a handful uh, while the 44 was much more balanced and forgiving of you know just about any driver I mean of course that's what Porsche had in mind you know they built a car with a big inherent design flaw and spent 40 years trying to overcome it. Well, the minute they tried to do away with that and just have front engine cars like everyone else, the purists put a kibosh on it and wouldn't let them. So what a Ah, oh, what a strange little car company. Uh, but anyway, it's a nice driving car. I wish I could do more of a run around, but um, I got to get it back to uh, Peter's. He's delivering it back to the guy today. And uh, I've got a meeting somewhere at 9 o'clock, which you know, clearly I'm already going to be late for. So <sighs> let me just do a quick U-turn in front of this dump truck, give it a little more goose, and then we'll head for home. Very nice steering response in this car. A little bit heavy, a little bit light. You know, it just feels very proper. And of course, that's that's the fun of driving these things. And that's why I say they're still Porsches. They've been engineered to be that, whether the purists like it or not. And uh, they are fun, uh, fun cars to drive. So, you know, even if they're not great cars, they certainly are good cars. And, um, and very rewarding to own. And, go getting in the third instead of fifth and uh you know a great little classic at this point in time so thanks very much for having a look really appreciate it and uh we'll keep trying to come up with some fun stuff to can what do we got ducks in the road ducks or vultures oh that's great what do they have there a toddler probably Ugh. anyway all right thanks for having a look we'll see you with the next one take care